Good evening. Um, my name is Charles Enoch. I'm the ESC Fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and I welcome you to the fourth in this term series of the European Political Economy Project seminars on issues relating to climate change. Today's topic is European green bonds and mechanisms for long-term policy commitment. There's been much recent focus on how climate change can be financed. Several countries and multilateral institutions have been issuing green bonds, borrowing to pay for investment in infrastructure to combat climate change. While these may make a useful contribution, there's some concern that in their present form, they may be to some extent greenwashing, helping finance what governments would do anyway, and perhaps even at a higher cost than other forms of finance. Daniel Hardy today takes a different and novel approach, proposing the introduction of bonds whose return will be determined by a country's achievement or overachievement of climate change targets. We should have a very interesting discussion. Daniel will present his proposal for 20 to 25 minutes. Then our two discussants, Petos Koch and Martin Ellison, will talk for about 10 minutes each. I will open the floor then for questions and answers. Please send your questions and answers to the Q&A function. And Julie Adams, who's behind the screen, um, will enable you to unmute yourself to ask them, unless you suggest you do, prefer not. Um, the presentations themselves will be recorded, but not the q and um, I'll now very briefly introduce our three speakers. More detailed bios have been circulated with the material for the seminar. Um, Daniel Hardy is an academic visitor here at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He was on the staff of the IMF for over 20 years and was involved in many aspects of the IMF's work, financial sector surveillance, fund-supported programs, and technical assistance to help build financial sector networks and institutions. Um, he led the most recent financial sector assessment program for the Euro area. And Daniel's also worked at the Austrian Financial Market Authority and the German Bundesbank. He studied at the University of Oxford and has a PhD from Princeton. Petos Koch is the head of the Public Debt Management Unit at the Directorate for Financial and Enterprise Affairs at the OECD. She coordinates all activities of the OECD Working Party on Debt Management. Her experience covers assessments of fiscal vulnerabilities and financial market risks in emerging and developed countries. Prior to joining the OECD, she was head of the Market Risk Management Department of the Turkish Treasury. She and co-authored several publications on sovereign debt and risk management. Martin Ellison is Professor of Economics here at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of Nuffield College. He gained his PhD in Economics at the European University Institute in Florence. He's currently a consultant at the European Central Bank and a member of the Finnish Economic Policy Council and a fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research. He's published several books and is currently editing several journals in the field of economics. So with that, I hand over to you, Daniel, to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, thank you also, Martin and Fatosh for being discussants and thank you to our attendees. Um, this, I started thinking about these issues. Let's go again. This one. Um, I started thinking about these issues of um, government, green debt, and so on. Really, when I was attending one of the OECD working groups on, on uh, debt at the invitation of Fatosh a few years ago, when one of the early issuers explained what they were doing and what the rationale was and what the challenges were. I've been thinking about it a bit ever, ever since, and I want to use the opportunity to share with you some of that thinking and also from that, what might actually be to do this a bit better than has been done in the past. So there has, as Charles mentioned, been a great deal of interest and visibility to government issuing green bonds. Here are some recent headlines taken from various publications. Uh, the UK is planning to, Italy, Germany, um, normally with some enthusiasm. Um, there's been a surge in green bond issuance. This is actually from 
OECD publication, indeed. So I've uh, nabbed that and that's about the fact of the presentation. I think Poland was the first for Belgium, Ireland, early issuers, recent Netherlands, Hungary, Germany. Now, Italy, the UK, Spain, and Sweden are planning issues. We see the amounts are going up fairly quickly from zero to now levels of tens of billions of dollars. So there's like a certain amount of money, but it's only been happening quickly. Become almost, I think by now, probably majority of countries in Europe, or at least in the European Union, now issued some form of green bond, or will do so in the next little while. And it's being imitated by emerging market countries, Fiji, Nigeria, Indonesia, et cetera, Malaysia. And most recently also, we saw, of course this year, we saw the next generation EU bonds with the EU is planning to issue about 250 billion euros worth of green bonds, which we use to, for grants or on lending for green projects in the member states as part of the COVID recovery and move to the next stage of the European project. So 250 billion would be more than all the others put together so far, but we spread over several years. To make it clear, we want to define a green bond, as now the term is used, as a fairly conventional medium term bond, um, but with an attached commitment to the financing goes some green spending. Uh, so it's not just that the bond is basically plain below bond, and it has this green overlay of a commitment. <laughs> And this requires some mechanism to verify the greenness of the spending. There are various taxonomies that are called to do this. You know, there's investments of this sort, and maybe some research or whatever else. There's some debate about that. And then they, you need to have some external service provider who verifies um, the greenness of spending when it's issued, but then for the life of the bond. The whole concept originated by some issues by the World Bank and EIB about 10 years ago. And now there are many also uh, private sector issuers and non-government public sector issues like the KFW in Germany and Fannie Mae in the US. In fact, the government's actually a relatively small part of the green bond movement. The questions that I'd like to raise and discuss with you today uh, starts with the question, what motivates this green bond issuance in Europe? And then once you ask that question, they ask, are these, valid motive? are these motives valid? Uh, are they really um, what, we also, what we ought to be using as justification for public policy action? And if they're not entirely valid, these motives, what might be better alternatives? The focus is on those three questions related to European sovereign issuance. So I'm not really going to talk about issuance by firms or subnational government or developing countries. And, I, and it'd be beyond the scope of the seminar to talk about this issue of taxonomies, what exactly counts as green spending, which is itself a whole little industry. So what are these motives we mentioned? Here is a survey from an organization called Climate Bonds Initiative, of what motivated green, sustainable and social bonds by emerging market developing countries. And the two, most prominent ones are trying to grow the market for these things, and the others to curb climate change. Uh, but there are also other benefits related to reputation, market signal, and, and, cheap, and, and so cheaper finance in the bottom is relatively unimportant for the advanced countries. Some of these categories, by the way, seem to be overlapping between reputation of benefit and market signal, seem much the same. There's also an issue where they just want to meet investor demand wherever it is. That's what these countries say themselves in motivation. I organize the motives into these seven items. Uh, the two being the most important, namely promoting the government's green investment somehow and reducing the funding costs or somehow improving the debt uh, financing, perhaps in non, not just in terms of yield, but also in stability. And we'll talk about these in turn and what are the arguments for and against them. So the most prominent public motive is that these, these bonds are going to somehow fund green spending by government. That's also meant to motivate the demand for these things. You're meant to feel good about it, you give your money, you get a decent return on your bond, and you fund some good long-term funding for, to protect us from climate change. That's what's said. 
The fundamental problem, and I think the core problem with the current approach to sovereign green bonds for investment in great countries, is that money is fungible. Money cannot be attached from, an, from the source of funding to spending, and in between it goes through this large part of the government's cash management. And for an investment grade sovereign, a large investment grade sovereign, which has a huge amount of debt and a huge amount of debt turnover and a huge amount of spending and all sorts of things, you cannot actually link the revenue from green bonds to any particular spending. Um, especially given that green, green bonds are actually rather insignificant relative to gross issuance. It's not just wrong, it's actually almost meaningless to claim the funds go to specific purpose. Um, this is a, a, a sort of concept mistake, I think, to say this. The market participants, at least the issuers and the big in, in, institutional buyers for this stuff, know this full well. And they understand that this claim that some are green investment in any direct way, the money is going for green, green investment, is not uh, as supportable. And pretending the other is, is basically misleading to the investors. Now, I do admit that the next generation EU funding could have a real effect. Because not like most of the other green bonds we've seen so far. First of all, to some extent, this money may go for just grants for things that would not otherwise have been done. It's well known for literature on development grants that if you give money to countries for particular projects, which they do anyway, it does not actually further that project. Here, perhaps they find some new projects which they wouldn't have spent the money on and just given the money. That makes sense. Another thing is perhaps that maybe the EU can borrow at significantly cheap better terms in some member states. However, the EU cannot borrow significantly cheaper than most members, than some of the big member states anyway. The likes of Germany and the Netherlands can borrow at significantly negative rates. You know, most of them are more than zero or negative rates. Any advantage from EU funding would be minor at best in the current low interest rate environment. We'll come over just how big this difference might be in a minute. So there's a problem that it's not clear how at all this green financing goes to green projects. Going beyond that, I'm not even sure whether this is the way, right way we want to do public policy. A spending decision should generally be based on the overall strategy for dealing with climate change or any other matter, the general policy discount rate, and not um, having this earmark spending and revenues. You know, even that made sense. What happens in practice, and I've asked debt managers about this, is the government decides on some investment projects, whatever, some spending priorities. Then later, the debt management office goes around and finds items that can be certified as green to attach to a green bond. So the spending decision is done months or years in advance, and then later, the green financing gets tacked on. Again, there's this sort of pretense about this. And were, indeed, were they even effective at, at, at promoting certain spending, would be even some question of whether green bonds might be rather distortionated policy. Um, because green spending by the government itself is only a small part of its role. And much of the spending related to climate change are things like taxation, regulation, and social protection. The green bonds would distort spending moving towards fixed investment and away from other perhaps more valuable policies. In general, trying to fix a, an issue is best done by instruments that target that issue and not doing it very indirectly through the financing. Second, we talk about the funding costs um, and perhaps creating a more stable investor base this is something which perhaps the, the, the debt managers are um, more ease with. Um, however, the reality is that green bonds from investment grade sovereigns are priced in line with conventional bonds. There may be a small premium, so called greenium, on these, but I suspect that if it exists, it will largely appear as a volume increase. And green bonds are now less than 0.5% of the debt stock. If they rose to 5% or 50% of the debt stock, they would not be green premium for sure. And furthermore, this any minimal premium that they may have is largely entirely offset by the verification costs. We have seen estimated about five basis points. Um, there is a consideration that green bonds expand investor base to more stable investors, people really committed to these sorts of things. And that could be of some value to smaller issuers something like Ireland or say, or Malta, but it's not really something applicable to France and the UK. I mean, how much more of an investor base do you want? The UK sells bonds everywhere on the planet. 
um, and needed some offset that may get a more stable investor base, then miss uh, some of the liquidity, which will also reside in the market. Here, by the way, some data from, again, I think this green bond initiative, which shows the pricing of recent German green bonds relative to an estimated yield curve. And if you look very closely at this picture, you can see some green and yellow dots, and orange dots reflect the, the, uh, the, the yields on green bonds, and some blue or gray ones, uh, which are the plain vanilla bonds. And the differences are very small, less than two basis points. Right? So I think it's more than offset by the added costs of issuing this stuff. Yeah. Again, this is generally the paradigm example of an investment grade, very liquid, big issuer, you know, you committed to being causes, but it's not making any cheaper or more liquid funding. Um, then this issue, maybe we just want to like meet investor demand for green assets. Okay, if we want it, so we're going to give it to um, Again, again, need to think what are they actually doing? The green sovereign bonds do not actually provide a hedge against transition risks. They don't provide a hedge against environmental risks, and they don't actually reduce environmental risk for the reasons I explained before, because the money is fungible. They're not somewhat contingent on what the, how big the risks are. Basically, they just give people the ability to appear to be investing in a green manner. They don't actually relate to sovereign to, to environmental risks or sovereign actions area at all. They just look good for the rest of us. Um, you say, well, maybe to set a standard this way. The, the sovereign sets it and others can imitate. Perhaps. But presumably you don't need to have 20 European countries setting the standard for green bonds. If you want a standard setter, you just want like one, a few big issuers. And that might be the IFC, the EIB. They set the standard. It doesn't help to have like a separate Danish sort of bond and, a, and an Irish bond and a, and a Portuguese bond. Just set whatever there's a few guys who set it and that's it. Furthermore, in my view, um, it's probably undesirable to set a standard based on something which might at best be described as non transparent. If you want to set a standard, you better set it right. Set something which is really an honest, transparent, with good governance uh, rather than these rather peculiar things we now have. And then there, it's just show how dubious it all is. The EU is going to go ahead and start issuing these green bonds even before its own taxonomy is finalized. So they're certainly not setting a standard when they don't have the standard yet. You know, from, I think the uh, um, IFMC's standard for now. There's also been suggested that maybe we should issue this stuff in order to review the popular willingness to pay for environmental policy. That somehow the premium shows how much the people are willing to sacrifice to take some green policies. That it motivated the Danes to propose having like a, a, a plain vanilla bond with a detachable green bag, which sell and buy and sell separately. Um, first of all, the evidence suggests the willingness to pay is near zero. Um, and then it's not clear what this information would actually show because these bonds are linked to particular spending, not to the overall policy stance. Um, and so I, I think this is not going to re reveal anything of value to governments. Uh, six, so nearly the end of the list of boss motivations, is promoting your own green financial sector. So you want it, the government does this, you're going to, you're going to sort of get some critical mass for your financial sector to uh, start issuing, get into the green bond market and uh, generally I don't know, improve your financial sector or something. This may be true to some extent, and this is a zero sum game between countries. If your country X and country Y has already done this, you don't want your financial sector to be disadvantaged, so you just to generate some business for your financial institutions. It's not perhaps a very nice motivation, but I think it is a motivation. Um, however, the effectiveness is doubtful. The UK some years ago tried to issue an Islamic bond or, or did issue an Islamic bond called a Sukuk um, with the idea of promoting London as a center for Islamic finance. Turned out, it did not really happen. There was not enough follow-up to that. And it turned out to be quite a difficult exercise. Again, a bit like with the problem with green bonds, in Islamic finance, you need to attach the bond to some particular assets, activities, and incredibly finding assets that are suitable. Um, it didn't work very well at all, and we no follow up. And finally, at this point, for, and it's talking about the European sovereign green bond market, 
when it's meant to be in a single market, and it's not meant to be the policy of any one country to promote their financial sector at the expense of others. Indeed, if you say that we issue state bonds to promote, to promote your financial sector, you're kind of saying it's a form of covert state aid. And finally, and I put this here somewhat provocatively, um, you could do this in a way like to, to show your good intentions, to show your moral leadership, uh, that, you, that your heart's in the right place. And if I'm saying they don't really, they don't really cost me, so why not, you know? Um, but then again, taking a step back from that, is this really the type of moral leadership we want? If it's not supported by any real commitment to anything, it's just cheap talk and unlikely to persuade anybody. And indeed, and, you know, we're kind of like maybe doing this rather than doing anything more substantial. It's easy to give the appearance of doing something by issuing these bonds for six billion pounds or euros, as much really than really tackling these issues, which can be costly, involve some big distribution costs. So I'm suggesting that in some ways, these, as they are now configured, the European sovereign bonds issued by the investment grade countries are largely a matter of giving good appearance and trying to protect their, or promote their financial sector, rather than having any particular effect on carbon emissions or any other um, climate change related issues. I'm therefore going to suggest that an alternative, which I think address most of all of these issues, um, which is suggest that it would make more sense for these sovereigns to issue what, I, what might be called green warrants. The bonds whose payoff depends on the achievement of the country's environmental standards. It's not attached to any particular projects or spending items, but to the overall progress of the country's entire outcome. For example, the, the country's CO2 equivalent emissions over some measurement period. It is, it's a return, it's, the target's overshot, the returns are higher, and the returns are lower if they're undershot. So there's been output-based uh, 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 contingent payoffs. And it has been actually suggested from some corporates in emerging market countries, including by the World Bank, um, which is a link here, of, a snap of what the thing down there has done. I've not seen this suggested for industrialized countries before, and I think they suit industrialized countries especially well because they are, are not credit constrained. There are possible schedules. So here on the horizontal axis is your country's CO2 e emissions. Here's a payoff on the vertical axis. The target is this cheerful pink line. And the same, for example, you could that the payoff is just a straight function of the emissions. Or you could have it more curved, saying you want to particularly penalize big overshoots and not reward too much undershooting. But you could have just kind of like an option pricing where you only penalize overshoots. And personally, I kind of like this one, this orange color, because it's the most simple and transparent to, to propose. I'm not sure how much undershoot we want to have. This is one that's easiest to sell. The advantages, um, it depends on the totality of government's policies. Therefore, it sends non-distortionary. It's, it's much rewarding, good regulation, good taxation of carbon, transfers to penalized groups as any other particular part of spending in this area. And kind of the other side of that coin is that it corresponds to the government responsibility. No matter of good governance, the government is like held to account for what um, it is responsibility. And, and the government's not responsible for any one particular project, it's responsible for the overall performance of the country. It's a matter of good governance. You're held to account not for whether you spent money on you know, that solar panel, then of what happens to the country as a whole. Because the, the government's not responsible, it's not elected for any one micro thing, but for its overall performance. And therefore, correspondingly, there's also no element of greenwashing. You're actually not pretending that money is going to a particular purpose, when it's not. Is it going to support your overall policy? Um, and and, and and we're being honest about it. We therefore, in a sense, a better example for market development. Um, we don't need to bother with all this verification taxonomy business. It's a lot cheaper. Uh, you don't need to have these disputes over the taxonomies. You're going to have to measure these carbon emissions anyway. Uh, potentially, if you get this in price there, there will be immediate feedback into how people have assessed the overall government's progress towards its goals. And I think that at least to some extent, there's a natural hedge in the sense that people are really going to want to buy this. 
particular um, those who may be hurt by excessive carbon emissions or weak, or weak policies, we want to buy this partly for the insurance value. And indeed, people are going to bear the cost, but we actually want to short it. But it does somehow relate to, at least potentially relate to some investors' needs in a way that linking to specific government spending does not relate to anybody's, anybody else's needs. And then justifying the title of this program, you know, long-term policy commitment, policy risk is one of the major impediments to long-term planning and investment. We've seen this in many countries, notably the United States over the last four or five years. You know, you're always one election away from the long-term project being made non-viable by some change in the policies. Sustainable investments, we need to do this transition are typically very sunk, they're very long-term, and very dependent on the, the regulatory environment. Um, and so if I wasn't doing this business of investing over 30 or 40 years, I'd be very worried about this policy risk. Um, and then uh, you know, the reality is that targets set in law are easy to change. The loan targets merely set by announcement by government. Here, we're going to embed the targets into a contract with investors. Those these sovereign green ones, the weak climate measures are explicitly costly to government. If you don't achieve targets, it costs them real revenue. Um, and I'm also suggesting that reneging would be relatively politically costly because we impose, be deeply opposed by the investor group. If you say, yeah, yeah, we committed that we didn't meet our targets to pay more, but we're just not gonna do that. I think this would be politically very difficult. Um, investors are a cohesive interest group, normally quite well-off people, kind of quite influential what the government does. It'd be difficult for government to, to just tear up the contract it's post. Not impossible, but difficult. And so therefore, these sovereign warrants would not only be better governance and better targeted at, at green policies, they'd also enhance the medium to long-term commitment, which is one of the biggest challenges in this area. I'm suggesting that my green ones would put your money where your mouth is. This is, uh, I think most of you recognize this building here. Okay. Really wanted to reinforce it um, and be uh, 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 um, idealistic. One could even imagine these green ones as being distributed to the population uh, so that basically the entire, the entire electorate would have a stake in not being innate. Um, but not so much people who don't care about climate change issues. We really need a wide constituency committed to these sort of targets. I'm conscious of the time. I don't want to go on too long about this. A few other things. There are complications. You need a border adjustment because a lot of the carbon emissions are effectively done out overseas if you import carbon intense products. You need to define the trigger variable, whether it's CO2, which is most transparent, or CO2 equivalent. You need to find the pay payout schedule that I mentioned before. There's other things like where the measurement points are and the period averaging. Um, and, um, and so I don't elaborate more on this. Um, but of course, I mean, sovereign could still grenade. We see this occasionally where governments claim to be committed to something even by law and they don't. In the UK, a while ago, they introduced the fixed term parliament law, the big deal to present governments could no longer choose the dates of election. Um, and they, by law, they fixed the times when the election take place. And then the first time it became inconvenient for government, they changed the law and got rid of it again. So you could still an egg, but this is trying to minimize that risk by creating a large widespread constituency, constituency against it. Summing up, I think the current European sovereign green bonds for the rest of great countries are at best a marketing gimmick, and at worst a form of virtue signaling and mis-selling, and a distraction from effective action. The people issue green bonds rather than doing what's going to take in terms of carbon pricing and other action. And sovereign green bonds offer better targeting of what we're really concerned about. They offer more honesty, they're simpler, and they enhance uh, the long-term policy commitment, which I admit may be one of the reasons why they're not so popular with governments. Finally, just to uh, leave you with some, uh, uh, something a bit different, saying this is a European political economy pro pro project. 
and government debt has been a central issue of uh, political economy for a long time in Europe. And why is in the picture on the right, we have the French population before the French Revolution under the burden of national debt. And so debt leads, leads to revolutions. On the left, we have Jacob Fugger, who financed the Habsburg's assumption of the uh, imperial crown and their marriages, which got them Hungary and Bohemia. So government debt is very much a central issue in political economy. And I think, I hope that I've um, provoked some thought about these things in this particularly important topic of uh, the green transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daniel, do you have to be share? Yes. There we go. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's very provocative. Um, Fatosh, over to you for your comments on this. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Charles. Um, yeah, it's been really um, interesting to hear um, Daniel's comments. Uh, the green bonds are, are basically you know, new instruments right? It's just they didn't exist uh, five years ago. Um, and in order to better understand the you know, supply and demand dynamics uh, of green bonds, uh, at the OECD, uh, we conducted, you know, several surveys. This is, uh, the, <laughs> this is what we do, <laughs> conducting surveys among debt managers. And also we um, discussed this uh, issue with uh, sovereign debt managers. And uh, I would say, some of them share the, the concerns that, that Daniel just raised um, in terms of liquidity of these bonds and then and how effective they would be uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, providing hedge against the environmental risks and then being a you know a major uh, conventional um, product. So in my presentation today, I'll try to to touch upon these issues. What are the main drivers, the motivations of sovereign issues that, that really issued uh, green bonds? And what are the concerns that they have? What are the obstacles, challenges um, that indeed lead, I think, Daniel's thoughts about, you know, what would be an alternative uh, given those uh, challenges? So uh, let me share my screen first. Oh. Um, so tell me if you can see it properly. Yeah. Good. 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 Okay. Well, as as uh, Daniel just mentioned, uh, ESG is becoming a bigger consideration for investors. Uh, well, I just read uh, today on uh, on this year's uh, this uh, week's Economist saying that uh, inflows into ESG funds for about one quarter of the total up from 10th in, in 2018. And on average, two new ESF you know, uh, funds are launched every day. This is a big number. So ESG's funds are still uh, small compared, to, compared with mainstream investment funds uh, because they are, I think, accounting only for like 2% of total investment funds, but they are rising fast. So in response to this, this supply, this demand, so to speak, uh, issuers, uh, sovereign issuers uh, take this into consideration. Uh, and then they started issuing uh, green bonds. So when we look at, when we ask them their, their main motivations, um, besides this, uh, this supply factor, this demand factor, they said uh, this diversification of investor base uh, has been the, one of the main um, motivation. And also they said it's their government. Uh, they ask them to issue this, uh, these bonds because uh, governments wants to display their moral leadership on, on climate change and sustainability. And this creates a positive market story when we look at you know, what, what happened to, to issuers like um, France, Germany, it created a positive story uh, media. And uh, there's also broader benefits uh, to the financial markets, such as developing and deepening this, uh, this market for sustainable finance uh, instruments. So overall, th these were the main uh, motivations uh, for issuers. 
And uh, with the COVID, um, you know, increased borrowing needs uh, due to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in 2020, we have seen, you know, widened scope uh, for, for green bond issuance. When we look at the numbers, um, today outstanding amount of sovereign green bonds uh, exceeded $130 billion um, as of, of February uh, this year. And, um, 40% of this outstanding amount was issued in, in 2020. So, so this is how the COVID uh, had an impact on, on green bond issuance because it created the scope, uh, as I said. But still, I mean, it's, um, the share of green bonds in total government bonds is are really, really small. It's less than 1%. And, uh, but uh, the momentum is expected to, to continue in 2021 with uh, new uh, prospective issuers uh, like UK, Canada, um, they have announced uh, their intention to issue the green bonds. So um, these are the main motivations and we will see uh, increasing um, number of issuers in, in coming uh, um, period. But when we look at uh, major challenges and uh, let's say obstacles, um, from, from an issuer uh, perspective, um, um, hold on a sec, it's just, uh, did I mention all the, yeah. Um, when we look at it, this, this new type of uh, bond, they, it has some special uh, features, I would say. But different from, from other you know, conventional bonds, it requires some uh, administrative work. For instance, uh, it's just the, you know, a number of uh, governmental uh, institutions, ministers, uh, they need to coordinate um, um, certain um, um, aspects of, of uh, green bonds in terms of the projects, the financing and the reporting, so on and so forth. So uh, it requires some certain level of coordination. And the second thing is it also requires monitoring and reporting activities, including external review procedures, which is costly. It's not just operational costs I'm talking about, but also uh, you know, uh, fees and other sort of uh, costs uh, involved in this process. And um, also that management offices, uh, they, they have to do, of course, special marketing activities, um, not just only to understand the, you know, investors demand, but also trying to, to uh, market their uh, new uh, instrument. And also in some cases, it requires some legislative changes because earmarking is, is, uh, is, uh, is forbidden in many, many uh, countries. And another um, obstacle uh, that they've been talking about is uh, is lack of uh, green eligible public investment. Daniel has just mentioned that you know there is this limited amount of, of uh, green eligible investment in, in government budgets. When we look at OECD figures, it's around you know just only four percent of total investments are, are green eligible. So this is this is and um, this represents a natural barrier, so to speak, uh, in terms of. Uh, how much uh, one country can issue uh, green bonds. And another um, concern is, is uh, that um, fragmentation uh, issue, uh, which means um, that um, it would cannibalize, so to speak, the liquidity in, in other uh, conventional instruments, creates a fragmentation. And uh, Last but not least, it's lack of standards and reference guidelines uh, is one of the major concerns by, by issuers. So let me um, just conclude uh, my presentation with longer term outlook. These are the, the questions that listed by, by um, some of uh, the members of the working party on that management. Um, because um, well, the thing is, when we look at the, the, the current environment, the green bonds, uh, sovereign green bonds attracts investors. And, and then as Daniel mentioned, uh, we talk about some, some greenium 
uh, advantage, but we don't know to what extent it will uh, it will stay here because now the, the demand for for green bonds uh, exceeds the supply, and that could be one of the main drivers of of greenium. But uh, we don't know uh, you know supply and demand dynamics going forward. If when the supply increases, uh, that greenium might might disappear, and uh, also, a second question is, is there a need to standardize green bonds to build a green bond market that, that become a, a more conventional instrument? Uh, the answer is a thing overall, yes. Um, um, and then third one is, is, is green bond, bond issues making a real difference uh, in, in climate change that could be that couldn't be achieved by other uh, more efficient means. This is a valid, a more fundamental question. I think Daniel was uh, trying to, to, to respond. Um, and then another one is, uh, what are the measures of success of a green bond program? You know, just every day we, we hear that, you know, uh, that a new country is issuing a green bond and it's very successful, but it's just the, the issuance at the stage successful, but we don't know the, you know, the longer period, for example, what would happen if one of those projects that this bond programs are linked to turned out not really green in long term, yeah. what will happen to the bond and liquidity and the, what would happen to the investor in that sense. Um, and uh, one last question, also very critical. Uh, what can DMOs do to respond to ESG sensitive investor demand? Is green bond, issuing green bonds or social bonds only one option? Are there other products like uh, Daniel was suggesting today? Uh, green brands could be one of the alternative products or or uh, what are the other ways that they can contribute to this discussion in terms of transparency? Um, could, this could be a, a holistic approach, right? Just the DMOs can support the, the, um, the dissemination of the information in terms of uh, uh, ESG. So I will stop here and hope that uh, we can discuss this further during the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Fatosh. Thank you. I think you need to unscreen share. Yeah, or I will do that. Uh, just hold on a sec. For your, yeah. Yeah. Just uh, hold on a sec. Oh. There we I think go. I managed okay. to do that. <laughs> Success. <laughs> okay, Martin, over to you. You may be muted. Yeah, he, he wouldn't let me unmute. I'd have to choose between slides and muting at the moment. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Speech That's and, and okay. We can hear you and see your slides. Perfect. Um, but first of all, thank you, Charles, for the introduction. But you missed one important detail out, which is that I'm an Antonian. Um, oh. Having been at St Anthony's in Ralph Darendorf's time. Oh, oh. It's very nice to be back, um, even if virtually. Nice. But I, I can walk past St Anthony still in Paris. <laughs> so to start off, um, thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you, Daniel, for the um, speech so far. I, I'd like to start off with, with a comment that I think we're all on the same page here. And so this has been a very welcome addition to the debate. And the same page is, we know that there's a transition to green economy coming to, to low carbon, and we'd like that to happen in the most efficient way. And we think, can we harness the power of markets and the power of government to help us go down that transition? So if I put two references up here, um, the left is from Schiller when he was in Oxford, given the, the Clarendon lectures. Um, macro markets 
creating institutions for managing society's largest economic risks. I think the climate is indeed one of society's largest economic risks. And I understand the talk that Daniel making as a way of creating institutions, ha harnessing mar macro markets to help us down that route. And this is all very topical because of what's going to happen in COP26. I, I see COP26 as aiming very much of thinking, how can we bring in private funding, private financing to help us achieve our carbon targets? And so this is the proposal that Mark Haney has made, building a private finance system for, for net zero. So I'm very much in favor of what we're talking about. I think we are orders of magnitude out at the moment. The amount of green bonds we got is trifling relative to what's actually going to be needed. But I'm prepared to talk all sorts of things that we can try to make this thing work better. So I like Daniel's idea and I'm gonna take it really seriously. So Daniel's idea was that we would have some contingency in that the amount that the government pays on its debt is a function of the amount of emissions it makes. So the more emissions you make as a country, the more you have to pay on these bonds that uh, Daniel is proposing. And that nicely gives you an incentive in the government to try to reduce the amount of emissions because then you're paying less on your debt. So it's clever. And it's nicely incentivizing the government to do the right thing. So that's quite appealing. What Daniel is really asking for is state contingency in debt. Here the state contingency is about the level of emissions. So we can look back at different types of state contingent debt that's been issued in the past. And there's a very nice database by Goncalo Pina about this. Start up the top left, 1863, the Southern Confederate States issued 20 year bonds, which were convertible to cotton at six pence in a pound. So you could either have the money or you could convert the thing into cotton. Going to the left, the one in, in French there, these are Pinay bonds from 1952, 60 year bond, issued with index to gold. Probably not a wise move ex post when you think what happened to gold prices since then. Perhaps even more interesting is the, the, the middle one. This is from 1956, which was an output linked bond. So this bond for again French paid 5% and then for every unit rise in industrial production in France from 1955 onwards, it paid an extra 0.05% on the return. So it was linking it to the amount of economic activity in France. And then finally on the right hand side, you've got Mexico in 1977 with these petro bonos, these petro, bon petro bonds, which paid out the maximum of a face value or the market value of oil. So there was some contingency built in. Because what happened in Mexico is the oil price went through the roof. The government went, oh, we don't really want to pay off all those promised values. So they made you convert oil prices into pesos using the official exchange rate, did a little bit of a trick. That's going to be a little bit of the feeling coming forward that I, I start to worry about. Okay. Let's look at a particular one that's perhaps the most relevant for what Daniel is proposing and look at Argentinian GDP warrants. So these were issued in 2005 as part of the debt restructuring. So it's going to pay out if there's real GDP growth above some baseline. So it's going to pay out in good times of real GDP growth. But it's also going to be conditional on GDP itself is not going to be higher, it is higher than if it compounded at a baseline rate. So they're, they're worried about GDP going up and down and up and down and them having to pay every time it goes up 
and nothing on the downside and up again. So they want to make sure that only if it's like going up year on year. And then they put a clause in there that says, well, we're only going to pay out as long as we've not paid out too much already. So cumulative payments have to be lower than some other threshold. But fine, these things were issued, contingency and debt. Markets did not like these. They were not popular and they traded at very heavy discounts. So there's some nice work from the IMF by Costa Chamon and Ritchie at that time, where they said, look, if we look at the premium of this particular bond over other defaultable bonds, it was 1,200 basis points at issuance. 12% is the extra you're paying. And it's just for this GDP contingency element of the bond, they were paying a very large premium. It settled down a bit after a few years, but was still 600 basis points. So a very, very large premium the market demanded to hold these GDP warrants. So why might that be? Really nice work now coming out of the IMF Research Department, as usual. This is work by uh, Roche and Rod Roldan. And what they do is they say, OK, what will be the premium that's payable on a GDP contingent bond? Look at the blue stuff first. The left hand side is a, a non-contingent bond. They model it, they calibrate it. There's a lot going on in the background. They're estimating that the return on that non-contingent bond is about eight and a half percent. That's pricing in some default risk. This is a country that is not particularly uh, solvent, so it may, there's a default risk, eight and a half percent. Now let's look at a bond which is contingent on GDP. So this is like Daniel's bond. Its payment is contingent on something. Here it's contingent on GDP. And let's imagine the market prices up that GDP contingent bond in the same way as they, con they price the non-contingent bond. What that means is they demand a premium of an extra 0.6% for that contingency. So the markets really don't charge much extra for that contingency on the bond. And in their simulations, that bond tends to be very, very popular. It'll have a high demand. It'll look great. Now, though, suppose market participants look at that new bond and they go, I'm not so sure about this. I don't really know is the distribution of the payoff something that I trust? Do I think the government is going to honour these? Do I think they're going to change the rules? In other words, do they have an issue about ambiguity of those? If they have ambiguity, what they do is they put extra probability on bad outcomes, they reduce probability on good outcomes, and they demand a premium for holding these type of bonds. Again, it's an exercise that Grosch and Roldan do. They find a very large premium gets charged for these uh, contingent bonds because of the ambiguity that surrounds them. And so they don't prove very popular. Markets don't like them. And so it's not very attractive. This is what I'm worried about taking Daniel's proposal very seriously, that is there going to be such a premium on his bond? So I'll summarize with one last slide that I get it, it's clever, it's good. Emissions contingent debt, it's going to incentivize the government to reduce emissions. Excellent, really like it. But if anything, the ambiguity here is, is huge. It's surely more ambiguity about how to get through the green transition than ambiguity of uh, making contingent on GDP. Uh, Lars Hansen is doing stuff on this about pricing up environmental risks. So the ambiguity is, is likely to be quite large. And if the ambiguity is large, it could get very, very big 
ambiguity premia coming in here, that markets wouldn't particularly like these. Now, I don't want to end too negatively, that would be unfair. Even the exercise that the IMF people are doing with these big ambiguity premia find that its welfare improving, so it's still worth doing. And they conclude that the results support a state contingent structure with linear indexation and potentially a threshold to cover against extreme left tail shocks of income. So by analogy, I guess that you could say, okay, we don't replace income with emissions. We're probably talking about a right tail risk rather than a left tail risk, but they could end up with a welfare improvement. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit, I, I'm worried, I think on two counts. One is not wanting to take away focus from other better initiatives that we might have. So I, I listened to a lot of the discussion about we don't really like green bonds because they're not doing anything. And I think I, I'm very sympathetic to that, but I sort of like the momentum that's behind those green bonds that we, we are sort of getting. Okay, I will stop there and I will very much enjoy listening to the other comments and the other questions that come in. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I think there's three very provocative um, presentations that one can challenge or ask or endorse. Can, can I just have